Ceramics have always played an important part in the management of electricity. Early power distribution depended on ceramic because of its excellent insulating properties and mechanical strength. The coming of the telephone and the wireless demanded the properties that only ceramic could offer. As these developed into our complex electronic industry, it was only natural that ceramics would find increasing wider application. Ceramic is no longer used just for its insulation properties or mechanical strength. It was found that it could be machined to very accurate dimensions, that it could be metallized, allowing it to be soldered or to have electrical conducting paths on its surface. A high glaze can be applied, which will resist moisture or fungus growth. Its dense composition, which does not trap gas, and its ability to stand high temperatures have made it a very useful part of both radio tubes and cathode ray tubes. Tektronics Incorporated of Portland, Oregon, early in their history, found that ceramic offered an excellent method of mounting delicate electronic components. A strip of glazed ceramic with silvered nut. Parts could be soldered directly to the ceramic. Patents were obtained on both the design and the manufacturing method. An entire plant was designed to build these ceramic parts. these are used each year in the manufacturing of cathode ray oscilloscopes. Thousands of precision ceramic parts are used in the building of cathode ray tubes. Insulating parts to support the cathode and heater wires. Rods to assure accurate alignment, supports and shields, delicate parts that must be machined to tolerances of a fraction of a thousandth of an inch, and must maintain such accuracy even when heated to red heat in the evacuation process. Such parts could be and were produced to the accuracy needed. The same properties that have made ceramic so useful inside the cathode ray tube have recently been found to be desirable as an envelope for the tube itself. Now this film will deal with some of the problems in the design and manufacturing of an envelope for a precision cathode ray tube. The basic elements of a cathode ray tube are, first, a device called a gun which generates a sharply focused beam of electrons. Deflection plates, which move this beam when suitable voltages are applied. A screen of fluorescent material that gives off light when struck by the electron beam. All in a highly evacuated container called an envelope. Modern tube design usually calls for one or more extra electrodes or bands in the tube between the gun and the screen. These are called post-accelerating electrodes as they speed up or slow down the electron beam after it has left the gun and before it strikes the screen. The shape and position of such bands is very important if we are to get a display with the least amount of distortion. The usual way of producing such bands is to apply conductive material to the inside walls of a glass envelope. Connections to such bands are made by sealing metal rods or buttons through the glass. Unfortunately, it is difficult to get accurate control of the wall thickness, 
Often there is distortion of the electric field near the buttons or leads sealed through the glass. In the design of newer tubes, and especially of storage types of cathode ray tubes, there was an increasing amount of problems. More leads had to be brought through the envelope walls. Multiple connections directly to conductive layers on the screen. Compact oscilloscopes demanded tubes of smaller physical size, yet with a full-size screen display. Instruments of higher precision needed tubes with less distortion of the trace. All of these demanded accurate, stable, internal dimensions of the envelope. Higher strength, freedom from strains, no discontinuities in the area of the feed-through connectors. Flat face plates with no rounded corners. These were some of the problems. A ceramic envelope for the cathode ray tube seemed to offer a solution to many of them. Let's watch a ceramic cathode ray tube being made. There are many different types of ceramic materials. The one chosen for the CRT envelope is one known as Forsterite. This material offers a combination of high strength, good forming properties. It is vacuum tight and has a coefficient of thermal expansion that closely matches that of the glass faceplate and neck to which it will be joined. The first step in the preparation of the forsteritic material is the weighing out of the basic raw materials. Suitable organic binders and lubricants, which aid in the forming operations, are also added. In this case, a batch is 800 pounds. The material is transported to a ball mill for mixing. Water is added to aid the mixing process. The batch will be tumbled four to six hours. There is well over a ton of one-inch alumina balls in the mill. The tumbling and movement of these balls not only mixes the material, but also grinds it to fine particle size. After mixing, the material is called slip. The slip is drained into 100-gallon holding tanks. It is kept agitated to prevent the settling of the solids. The forming process used in making ceramic envelopes starts with a dry powder so the next step is to remove the water. It is done here in the spray dryer. The liquid slip is pumped in through a fast revolving atomizer wheel, which breaks it into little drops. Hot air forced into the dryer removes the water from the drops, leaving a fine dry powder that can be easily handled. The powder tumbles to the bottom of the dryer. The basic ingredients for the phosphoritic ceramic are now thoroughly mixed and are ready for the forming operation. A major advantage of ceramic as a CRT envelope is that the internal shape and dimensions can be more accurately controlled. Now this is largely due to the manner in which the material is formed. Unlike glass, which is normally formed by forcing the molten material inside a solid mold, the ceramic material, in powder form, is pressed around a solid mandrel. The inside surface then takes on the exact form of the mandrel. There are three things necessary to form the forced right powder into the desired shape. A hydraulic chamber, a solid mandrel, and a flexible boot to force the material against the mandrel. The mandrel is made from polished metal. It must be solid so that it will not distort or give under pressure. The sock or boot is made of elastic material. Its purpose is to hold the forsterite powder and force it against the solid mandrel when hydraulic pressure is applied. A trademark or other detail may be molded into the boot. Such detail in turn will be transferred to the outside of the finished ceramic. The 
The area between the boot and the mandrel is filled with the fine washerite powder. It is vibrated to compact the material, assuring more even wall thickness and material density. About two pounds are required to fill this mold for a five inch tube. The end is sealed and the top and bottom are clamped to prevent liquid entering the cavity. It is washed to remove excess material on the outside. This is the isostatic press used for the more common types of ceramic tube envelopes. It is entirely automatic in operation. Two envelopes are pressed at a time. The walls are made of steel of the same quality used in the chamber of a large gun. A tightly fitting screw lid will stand the high pressures needed. Hydraulic pumps pressurize oil. This pressure in turn is transferred to water compressing the boot containing the ceramic powder. The mandrel is solid. Oil and water cannot be compressed, so the full pressure of 13,000 pounds per square inch is applied to the powder. Let's watch another cycle. The boot is filled. The ends are clamped. It is washed. the press. Over six tons of pressure on the powder. It is no longer powder, but a solid piece, the exact shape of the mandrel. The CRT envelope has taken shape. The smooth sides of the mandrel have been accurately reproduced. The trademark has been transferred from the boot. At this stage, the unfired ceramic is known as greenware. <laughs> Larger tube envelopes and some specials, where the production runs are limited, are handled on these semi-automatic presses. walls. The material is abrasive, so a carbide drill is used. At this, the greenware stage, the material is easy to work or machine. Later, after firing, it will be very hard and can only be cut or drilled with diamond tools. The flash or extra material on the faceplate end is cut off. The extra material at the neck end is not cut off now, as it will help to keep the neck from distorting at the high firing temperatures. Also, more accurate dimensions are assured if this is done after firing.
The greenware funnels are ready for the first of three firings. They are placed in a special container known in the ceramic industry as a sagger to protect them from the direct flames in the firing. The ceramic envelopes are fired in specially built furnaces called kilns. This kiln is about 70 feet long. It is heated with natural gas. Parts take 16 hours to move through the kiln. In the initial stages, the binders and lubricants are burned out. The kiln is automatically controlled. The instruments check the temperature, record it, and adjust the gas if necessary to maintain a constant temperature. In the center of the kiln, the envelopes reach a temperature of approximately 1,200 degrees C, over 2,200 degrees F. This is where the raw materials actually turn into a forsteritic ceramic. Shrinkage takes place as chemical reactions occur, changing the original powders into vitrified or fused ceramic. The CRT envelope, pressed from dry powder, is now a solid single piece of vitrified ceramic. The ceramic is hard and strong, it is non-porous. It will not absorb water or gas. It will hold a vacuum. And unlike glass, strains cannot cause trouble later. The next step is to cut off the next section. The ceramic is extremely hard now and can only be worked with diamond tools. This saw is made of soft copper embedded with diamond dust. Water serves as a lubricant. All the funnels will be given a 100% inspection at this point. Tiny cracks or porous areas might not show up with just a visual inspection. They are soaked for a few minutes in the solution of fluorescent dye. Washing removes the dye from the smooth, unbroken surfaces. But any crack or imperfection will retain it. An inspection under ultraviolet light will show the trapped dye. Electrical conductors are needed on the inside and the outside surfaces of the envelopes. In addition, electrical connections must be made through the walls so that vacuum tight seals can be made later without interrupting the electrical path. We first apply the outer conductive paths. Silver is a satisfactory material. It is applied in the form of a paste or paint. Metal particles in an organic binder. The binder will be burned away later, leaving pure silver. The metal must continue through the holes to make contact with the inside conductive bands. The inside conductive layer must meet several critical requirements. It must resist oxidation so that it will not deteriorate during handling and processing. It must be a material that is stable in a vacuum, one that does not give off gas to contaminate the finished tube. It must have good conductivity, and we must be able to apply an even layer without voids. The noble metals offer such properties. The interior wall coating is an alloy of palladium and gold. Like the silver, it is applied as metal particles in a binder. Although we will be needing separate bands, at this stage, the interior is completely coated. The envelope will be fired once again to convert this coating to metal.
In this firing, electric heating is used. The temperature is automatically monitored and controlled. It is time now to separate the inside metal coating into separate individual bands. Fine abrasive powder propelled by a jet of compressed nitrogen cuts a tiny line. We now have separate metal bands, insulated one from another by the ceramic. We need a smooth flat surface on both the neck and the screen end in order that we can attach the glass. Both ends are lapped with abrasive material to get the necessary finish. A final wash removes the lapping compound that has been picked up in handling. The envelopes are sent to final inspection. In this operation, the physical and electrical properties are checked once again. A completed ceramic envelope is sealed in plastic. It will now be sent to another building to be finished into a complete ceramic cathode ray tube. This is the electron devices or CRT building. Here, the complete cathode ray tubes are manufactured. Small gun parts formed and welded. Cathodes coated and assembled. The complete electron gun assembled. and screens deposited. Careful work, exacting work. Both glass and ceramic tubes are manufactured. We will go to the area making the ceramic tubes. Much of this work is done under clean room conditions. The purpose of the holes was to provide an electrical conductive path from the inside bands to the outside conductors. There is an unbroken metal layer through the hole. Now, the hole must be filled. A paste of finely ground glass plugs the hole. Later, it will be melted into solid glass. Glass must be fused to the ceramic to make a one-piece structure that is mechanically strong and vacuum tight. The face plate end is prepared with a suspension of powdered glass in a binder. This will be permitted to dry. The binder is sticky and tends to hold the glass to the ceramic. There will not be a good mechanical bond until they are fused together at high temperature. The fluorescent screen material has been deposited on the polished plate glass faceplate. An additional bead of powdered glass will assure a proper bond to the ceramic. The assembled envelopes 
are held in alignment on these racks. One final step now in the manufacturing of a solid one-piece ceramic glass CRT envelope. The units will be brought to a temperature high enough to melt the glass powder, fusing the faceplate and neck to the ceramic and burning away the binders. A graphite conductive coating is painted on the inside of the glass to act as an electrostatic shield to the deflection plates and the gun. A final continuity check assures that nothing has shorted out the various internal bands. Now, in a different area, the tube envelopes have been pre-warmed and are ready to be joined with the completed electron gun assembly. After assembly, the gun was cleaned in solvents and wrapped in foil for protection. on the chuck so that it turns true. The area near the seal is heated. moisture entering the tube, the air is removed with a vacuum pump. It is filled with dry nitrogen and capped with a plastic cap. We are ready now for the final but one of the most important steps in the making of a ceramic cathode ray tube, the pumping or evacuation. One of the advantages of the ceramic envelope is that it may be heated to a higher temperature than glass without softening or distorting during the evacuation. The high temperature helps to drive out gas from the envelope walls. The pump station consists of a mechanical pump, an oil diffusion pump, and a freeze-out trap with liquid nitrogen to freeze out the final gas molecules and prevent them re-entering the tube. An ion gauge indicates the ultimate vacuum obtained.
The tube is complete now. The glass stem has been sealed off so it can be removed from the pump. The only steps remaining are to put the tube base on, activate the cathode, and carefully check the tube to assure that it meets all specifications. And the final step, of course, installing the ceramic tube in the oscilloscope. This completes our story, a combination of the old and the new. Ceramics, one of man's first industries brought up to date to provide a part for our latest industry, electronics. A precision cathode ray tube of higher performance, tighter specifications, improved accuracy, and extended life made possible through the use of ceramics. A tube which we are proud to have carry the name Tektronix.